Um, welcome everybody to the webinar called Empowering Your Board to Lead, Understanding the Roles and Responsibilities of Your Board of Directors. My name is Ellen Yin Wyckoff. I'm the Nonprofit Sustainability Technical Assistance Specialist with the National Resource Sharing Project out of the Iowa Coalition Against Sexual Assault. I want to welcome everybody here for joining in on this webinar today. I also wanted to just introduce a couple of other folks that are on the line with us. I have Valerie Davis, who's also with the National um, Sexual Assault Resource Sharing Project. Val, if you want to say hi, you're welcome to do so. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Okay, and we also have our presenters online, Kat Fribley and Kim Gandhi, who I'll have, um, have them introduce themselves in a few minutes. But first of all, we just wanted to take care of a couple of details. For those of you that are joining in the line, please be sure that the audio portion is working. You can either um, get audio for today's webinar through by turning on the speakers on your computer, or you can call in on the conference line. And the uh, information is noted on the screen right now, and also on the upper left-hand corner of your screen. The other thing I wanted to do was just to give you a little bit of information about um, our project and also how our project is funded. It is it. Our project is supported by through a grant through the office from by the Office on Violence Against Women through the U.S. Department of Justice. What we also wanted to note is that the information that's provided in today's webinar, that the opinions, findings, conclusions, and recommendations expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Department of Justice Office on Violence Against Women. Now, to tell you a little bit about our project, um, we're part of the Nonprofit Sustainability Technical Assistance Project that is a program of the National Resource Sharing Project out of the Iowa Coalition Against Sexual Assault. And we're also doing this in partnership with the National Network to End Domestic Violence. And that this project provides web conferences, coaching calls, and technical assistance on a variety of nonprofit management and sustainability issues. Again, my name is Ellen. You're welcome to contact me if you ever require any assistance or have any questions, not only about today's webinar, but anything that may be um, that you may have questions about regarding your grants, regarding your, your programmatic issues and such, you're welcome to feel free to contact me. And my contact information is listed on the screen. The other thing that we'll be doing after this webinar is that we'll also be having um, offering coaching calls on this topic that are available for small groups. And so that information will be posted on our NSTA listserv. And so feel free to look forward for that information. And we'll be sharing that with you soon. The other thing that we wanted to cover in today's, for today's webinar is how to use this technology. Um, I mentioned earlier how you can access the audio for uh, today's webinar. I see many of you are accessing the audio through the Internet, and you're also welcome to call in on our conference line with the information that's up there. The other thing is if you experience any technical difficulties during the course of this webinar, you're welcome to contact our web, um, web conferencing software provider through iLink, and their phone number is listed on the screen. The other thing that we've done is we've disabled the public chat function um, for this webinar. But what we want to do is encourage you that if you have any questions about the content or the information being shared in this webinar, to please feel free to use the private chat function that's on the lower left-hand corner of your screen. What you can do is click on my name, Ellen Yen Wyckoff, under the private chat, and it should open up a box that you can type in your question. So we really want to encourage you throughout the course of today's webinar to feel free to utilize that private chat function. If you'd like to send me a test message, you're welcome to do so now. The other thing that I wanted to share with you is that the PowerPoint presentation, as well as the recording of this webinar, will be the information will be sent to you within the next two weeks. Many of you should have also received the PowerPoint presentation and the handout in the reminder email that we sent for today's webinar. The other thing that will happen at the conclusion of today's presentation is that when you click out of the screen for the webinar, you will be um, directed to our online evaluation. And we really want to encourage you to provide us feedback about today's webinar. So what we'd like to do to start off with today's presentation is to just go through a quick polling question. And um, what we would like to do is ask for you folks to go ahead and answer this question. Which of the following best describes your role or your position at the agency? And it should be activating off to the side.
Ellen, I don't see the answer poll popping up. Yeah, Are other I, folks seeing that? I don't believe it is. That's why I'm trying to make sure that it's coming on. No, but while you work on that, why don't um, Kim and I take just a couple of minutes and introduce ourselves um, and get ready for the rest of the content of the presentation. Kim, does that sound okay with you and do you want to start? Sure, that's perfect. I'm Kim Gandy. I'm the President and CEO of the National Network to End Domestic Violence, but I have the privilege of being part of this webinar, I think, because I've served on and shared quite a number of boards over the last 30 years, including some very large national boards. So I've had a chance to see firsthand the results of great board ED partnerships, as well as what happens when one or the other doesn't carry out their roles or tries to cross over and fill the other party's role. Um, it's not pretty. And so I look forward to talking with you about what works. <laughs> And my name is Kat Fribley, and please feel free to be answering um, the poll that I see now has popped up to the left of your screen. It should say feedback and give you the option to look, or sorry, to click on A, B, C, or D, which corresponds, of course, to the answers on the slide to the right. Um, I'm thrilled to be joining Kim today in uh, talking about empowering your board to lead. Uh, I have been uh, doing this work in the anti-sexual assault movement um, for going on 20 years now and have reported to boards and been on boards and have spent really the last 14 years of my time here with the Resource Sharing Project, um, which I direct for the Iowa Coalition Against Sexual Assault, with a significant focus on developing boards and on supporting um, folks in really putting great governance um, in place for organizations, knowing that that is one of the key uh, components to a strong and sustainable organization. So we're really excited to have all of you on the line today to join us to talk about the ways um, that we can make uh, sure that all of the information around roles and responsibilities and board structure are, are things that are clear and uh, understandable for the, both the uh, staff as well as for the board in order to make sure that there is that smooth and good governance relationship that Kim was talking about that can so support um, an agency. Okay, so well, Ellen, you, yeah. Great. Well, thank you. And thank you, everybody. It looks like we've gotten the polling feature to work, and it looks like that we have the majority of folks that are on our call, about 38% of them are executive directors or the heads of their agencies, and that we have about um, some of the folks that are on our call, about 17% of them are board members, and we really appreciate many of the board members taking the time to join us in today's webinar, and that we also have um, remaining about 42 to 45 percent. It's been fluctuating a bit, but in terms that are administrative and program staff at your agency. So, so thank you for sharing that. We will also be featuring some polling questions throughout um, today's presentation. So in terms of our time today, Kat, do you want to take a few minutes going over what will be covered? Absolutely. So some of the things that uh, when you are building a really strong um, and vibrant uh, board uh, that can help to sustain and lead your organization, um, uh, one of the things that we know is that it's uh, important that everybody understand the basics of an effective and responsive board structure. So we're going to spend some time today um, talking about that. We also hope that today uh, we'll be able to spend some time articulating the three duties and ten responsibilities responsibilities, um, very specifically, of a board of directors, um, and that when participants walk away that you all will understand the financial role of the board uh, in terms of both big picture um, and in terms of fundraising. And that participants today will also have an opportunity to learn about key aspects, key other aspects of board governance. Um, so that is really how Kim and I are hoping to um, spend the next hour or so with you all is um, walking through those um, major objectives. Great. And so we're also going to have a final polling question before we start the content for today's webinar. 
So the second polling question, um, if you want to take, go ahead and take time to answer, is how many members do you currently have in your board of directors? So question, response A, five or less, B, six to ten members, C, 11 to 15, or D, more than 15 members? So we still have folks responding. It looks like the majority, over 50% of you have six to 10 members on your board, and that about 35% about of them are that, that you have 11 to 15 members on your board, and we have a few folks, about less than 10% or 8% of them, that have more than 15 members on the board. So that kind of gives us a sense of who we have on the call today. So really appreciate you folks taking the time to answer and respond to our poll. And that really launches us in many ways, Ellen, I think, into the conversation about general board theory and effectiveness. Um, because certainly one of the things that we know is that the number of folks who are on our boards is often determined by our bylaws. Um, however, hopefully the number within the bylaws was determined in order to support the very best sort of structure and effectiveness of a board for your agency. Um, so we want to take the first uh, bit of time today to talk about some big picture general board theory and effectiveness um, uh, topics. And within that, I would say composition, diversity, and structure um, are some of the top um, sorts of considerations when you are putting together um, a board of directors and, and for a board of directors as they are doing their work. Um, certainly, the responsibilities, as we know, of a board um, uh, really suggest what skills and areas of expertise a board should have overall and collectively possess. Um, we know that for many of us, that includes um, such things as nonprofit management, fundraising, personnel management, uh, legal matters. Overall, when we're talking about governance of our organizations in order to be able to carry out the work of serving survivors in our communities and working on the prevention of violence, we know that there are lots of different deliverables and activities that go along with that, as well as um, the um, sort of effective administration and running of our agencies. So as we are putting uh, together a board and looking at board composition, we certainly want to draw from those skill sets that are going to best support all of that work um, that we are doing. Um, one of the things that we know is that um, traditional models of governing boards um, have largely been homogeneous and have helped to really establish and maintain in a larger picture a model for class, ethnic, and um, racial and sex discrimination throughout society. And many of our organizations uh, have been uh, working in um, really diligent and in very intentional ways to diversify um, uh, not only our boards, but um, our organizations and to make sure that we are reflective of our communities in uh, the way that is necessary in order to be able to provide services. So when we talk about um, ways that the composition of a board and that drive to sort of diversify a board um, is important, it is important not only in terms of uh, the sort of big picture accountability um, uh, model but also because as we look at, uh, again, the fact that our organizations should reflect our communities, we recognize that really that membership composition makes such a difference for the ways that we make decisions. And that um, having organizations be responsive to our diverse communities means that our boards need to be made up of those diverse communities. Then some of the ways, I will say, that um, we have found to um, very intentionally focus on building and maintaining board diversity <clears throat> is making sure that folks on the board, specifically usually the nominating committee, are tasked with thinking about this in a very um, ongoing way. Um, that this isn't something that we are thinking about only once a year when it comes time to sort of um, recruit and put forward a new roster of board members, but rather that racial and cultural diversity is sort of a constant organizational priority and that we're focusing on building relationships within our communities that can feed into our board in such a way that we become reflective of those communities that we're serving. 
when we talk about um, building and maintaining diverse boards, we are absolutely not talking about tokenism. Um, certainly when we talk about uh, tokenism, we are talking about an expectation that people of color especially represent entire communities. Instead what we are talking about is finding um, a, a way for your board to put in place expectations around being um, uh, inclusive and being uh, a model of your own community's um, um, diversity. So when we're talking about uh, the ways that boards very specifically um, can attempt to build and maintain diversity, we want to also acknowledge that within that it's critical that board and staff are engaged in ongoing anti-racist and cultural diversity training that this conversation is one that is happening at the board level, at the organization level, and then certainly that is, is reflected in the composition of the board itself and the ways um, that your board is focusing on, uh, on inclusion and recruitment. When we think about boards, one of the things that I think is, um, is such a challenge oftentimes, and I want to just acknowledge as somebody who has been on many community boards as well as reported to boards, that I am well aware of the fact that most of us have boards that are made up of incredibly passionate, committed individuals, folks who are doing this because they, tr they believe so deeply and truly in our cause that they are willing to give their time their money, their expertise, their effort um, to help govern our organizations and make them strong and sustainable for survivors in our communities. One of the things that I think boards sometimes struggle with is the expectation that actually every board has a fundamental responsibility for self-management. And when I say that, what I mean is that a board should sort of be a self-cleaning organism, if you will, um, that they themselves are the ones who are responsible for creating a structure for the policies and procedures that they put in place to really support that good governance that they're doing. Um, and overall, that means everything from the very smallest of tasks um, that the board is responsible to up to the bigger tasks. And I think sometimes it is those uh, smaller tasks that boards fail to think about as their role. Um, for example, things like preparing a schedule of board meetings or identifying what it is that um, is a gap in knowledge for your board and seeking out additional education or training um, or information about that, that knowledge gap um, to inform the work that you're doing in terms of governing um, this agency. So as we're thinking about and talking about how the board should be structured, we want to make sure that folks are um, cognizant of the fact that the board itself is, uh, is responsible for that fundamental self-management. Um, not an executive director, not someone within the agency, um, but the board members themselves. So I'm wondering as we talk about this, um, uh, I'd like to put up another poll. Um, and I'm wondering if the composition of an effective board of directors should be or would be diverse in terms of race, ethnicity, et cetera, in its membership. Is that a true statement or a false statement? I hope folks are able to answer this as we get ready to move on to the next set of questions. Ellen, how is that poll um, coming out? It looks like we have about we have about ninety six percent of the uh, individuals that are saying that it's coming out true. Mhm. Mm and that we have a few folks indicating that it's false. Certainly, one of the things that we want to um, be aware of is that there is no uh, organization that is not um, responsive and accountable to the communities that we are within, and that all of our communities hold diversity, uh, racial, ethnic, uh, sexual orientation, class, 
uh, uh, religion, and that we, when we're talking about board factors and diversity, we want to be mindful certainly of all of those different identities that people are able to bring to the table to help guide the decision making of the agency. However, as we um, sort of talk about the structure of a board, I wanted to focus on the racial and ethnic diversity very specifically because traditionally boards have been homogenous uh, uh, um, entities. And as our organizations are trying so diligently um, to be responsive to the needs of underserved communities and um, to the real diversity of um, survivors that we know exist, that we ourselves should be reflective um, of those, that same diversity. So thanks, folks, for, for answering um, uh, that polling question. Hi, and this is Kim now. One of the reasons I think that it's so important for us to be intentional about diversity on our boards is for all of the reasons that we are intentional about hiring for diversity and the reason that businesses are more effective when they have a diverse workforce. And it's the simple fact that people tend to hire or bring on people who are like themselves. And if you have a, a homogenous board and the board is self-selecting, the board is reaching out for new board members, without some intentionality, you're going to end up bringing in other people that look just like you. And that's why you have to have intentionality around your, uh, your choices and particularly for your nominating committee and thinking about that. And Kim, can I say that I think that there are just a couple of places, actually, as you're talking and as I'm thinking about it, where, where there is a slightly different model, and that that is in culturally specific organizations and mm -hmm. tribal organizations. If there is an organization which is um, in many ways uh, um, uh, derived from and, and for um, a, a specific racial or ethnic population, then it would make sense to me that there may be not a, a sense of racial diversity on that board because the leadership should be reflective of the community that's being served again. Um, right. But so I, as you were talking, I just that was one of the things that came up for me that I wanted to make sure to say that, there, that, that when we're talking about serving a specific um, population, that that might look a little bit different in terms of what diversity looks like on our boards. Right. But then you'll find other kinds of diversity. Exactly. Because exactly. You know, obviously that's really important. So uh, the next item is the three duties of a board. And these are, these are really your legal responsibilities. And they've been boiled down to care, obedience, and loyalty, which doesn't make much sense when you just look at the list. A sticking cold. And, but I couldn't think of a D to go with it. The, uh, the duty of care is, is really a very simple one. It just means you have a responsibility to take care of the nonprofit. It just means being responsible in the, the use of the organization's assets, whether it's the, the people, the, the physical plant, or, or even the goodwill of the organization. And, and when you're taking care of a nonprofit, it means that you're providing oversight for the activities and you're working to make the nonprofit effective and sustainable. Some people call that a duty of due care. But it's a really simple, straightforward responsibility. Duty of obedience, I always thought was odd, but it really is about obeying things. You have a responsibility as a board member to make sure that your organization obeys all of the laws that applied to it apply to it and um, obeys the, the ethical practices that you would want them to comply with and that the law requires. You want to uh, ensure that the organization is obedient, if you will, to its stated purpose, to its mission. When you've adopted a mission on, be on behalf of the organization, that's one of the things that the board does is make sure that the organization follows that mission or is obedient to that mission. So that's all that means. The duty of obedience is it's about obeying the things that you're supposed to obey and the board's responsibility to make sure that happens. And the last one, the duty of loyalty is, I think it's really straightforward, but this is where I see boards going sideways. The duty of loyalty simply means that board members make decisions in the best interest of the organization and not in um, his or her personal self-interest or in the interest of 
uh, another organization that he or she might be involved in. Um, this comes into play sometimes when you have, uh, for example, member programs that are serving on a national or state coalition board. The board members have to separate their roles and say, okay, today this is the hat I have on. I am a board member of this national coalition or this state coalition, and I am here to do what is best for and right for this organization and its mission and not be thinking about this other organization that I run and my interest in having that organization receive uh, services from or benefits from uh, the other organization. It's, uh, and sometimes that's hard, but it's, uh, it's your obligation as a board member to, to separate those and operate uh, from your duty of loyalty to this board, not your duty to the organization that you lead or that you work for with your other, with your other hat on. So those aren't too complicated. They're actually pretty straightforward. The, uh, the next one is the uh, 10 responsibilities of nonprofit boards. And you can find different lists and different sources. You'll find 12 responsibilities, 9 responsibilities. Everybody has their uh, their list of responsibilities, but when you look at them, it, it really does boil down to the same, the same set of things. And the, the first one is almost always determining or refining the mission of the organization or agency. What is the purpose of the organization? And that's the board's responsibility. I had a conversation just yesterday with someone who said, well, you know, whose responsibility is it to have the vision for the organization? Because it seems to me that the executive director should have the vision and the board should help the ED carry it out. <laughs> so we had quite a long conversation about whose responsibility that is. And it's not that the uh, that the chief executive does not play a part in the strategic planning, for example, and participate in the visioning. But that's the, the final analysis, that's what the board does. The board has to articulate that statement of mission or statement of vision and purpose that says who the organization is, who they want to be, what their goals are, how they're going to achieve those goals, and and very importantly, who their constituents are, because that's often a source of, of um, confusion or misdirection in an agency, who are our primary constituents. The, uh, this almost always the second thing on the list of board responsibilities is uh, selecting the chief executive, selecting the executive director, and then supporting the executive director. Those two are sometimes uh, combined. And boards have to figure out what the chief executive's responsibilities are going to be and then undertake a search to find the best person for that job. And it may be that the person is already at the agency, but the search process will help refine that. And that's really the board's obligation. And again, this is an area where so many things go south on boards, and it's because the boards didn't think hard enough about what they wanted. They didn't take the time to think about what the specific qualities were that they were looking for, other than to make a list that you would have to, you know, God perhaps might <laughs> fill all of those qualities, like, okay, yeah, you're not going to get that person. But what are the most important things? And then maybe you'll get some of these other wishes as well. But the board has to set its priorities and think that through before hiring the ED, and then supporting and evaluating the ED, making sure that the executive director or your chief executive has the support of the board, the moral support, professional support, whatever he or she needs to further the goals of the organization, the board has to be standing ready to provide those and to help make those possible, and, and to think critically also about the evaluation process, which we'll talk uh, more about later. And Kim, can I add one more that I Please. realize I don't think is, is uh, laid out or, or articulated in this, but boards are also responsible for um, the firing or dismissal of executive directors when that becomes necessary. 
Yes, and certainly supporting and assessing the performance, um, it, that could be um, sort of implicit within that, but I do want to make it explicit because it's often one of the most difficult decisions that a board has to make, and it's one that needs to be come to thoughtfully, of course, um, but it is absolutely part of the board's overall responsibility in terms um, of leadership of the organization and the relationship with the executive director. Exactly, and you know we've we've both seen situations where the board acted far too quickly, and situations in which the board waited far too long to take that action. So that's something that the board has to confront head on if it looks like there's a problem, and and not shoot the messenger. Absolutely, absolutely. So planning for the organization's development really just means planning. It can be uh, it can be strategic planning but it also has to be strategic thinking. Um, we're not talking just about long-term planning. It, we're talking about annual planning, planning your annual goals. And that, this is not something that the chief executive should be doing alone. The board really ought to be an active part of that overall planning process and then work with the ED and assist in implementing whatever plan you put into place, and of course monitoring how it's being implemented. This is, a, this is again one of the key roles of the board is to participate in the development of the organization's plan. And, and something that's been really popular lately is um, a not a strategy, not a strategic plan, but a strategy screen. I think LaPiana uh, Consulting popularized this, but a lot of organizations are using it now. And it's really just a process that you go through to identify the list of things that you will consider or consult when deciding whether to take on something new. And what questions do you ask yourself when you're thinking about uh, applying for a new grant, for example. And you run these things through your strategy screen as part of your decision-making process. And that's something I think a lot of organizations have been using recently and found very helpful. Ensuring adequate resources for the organization. And of course that primarily means financial resources, but resources is a broad term. But making sure that the organization has what it needs to operate. And so often this is left only to the executive director, who then is criticized by the board for not raising enough money. And so really, this is something that the board ought to be very, very involved in. This should not be a situation where you just say to the executive director, okay, go forth and raise all this money. That's got to be part of your job as well. And then once you have those resources, the board has the obligation to ensure that the resources are managed well. And that most of that is in the category of financial oversight, um, developing the budget and making sure that the proper financial controls are in place, both policies and procedures. Uh, determine and monitor the organization's programs and services to ensure mission, I think, is an area of, of some challenge for organizations. Um, executive directors often feel that boards are looking too closely at what they're doing, or boards feel that the executive directors are not, um, you know, don't welcome them to look and see what the programs are doing other than to say, ooh, ah, lovely. But that's part of your job too, not to run the programs, but to monitor how effective they are and whether they fit in with the mission of the organization. The executive director shouldn't be embarking, embarking on a whole brand new area of operation without that being a, a decision made jointly with the board because if it's, you, you want to determine that it fits with the board's mission. So that's part of, part of the board's job is to look at those programs, look at those services, and make sure they are fitting with the mission that the board has established. The, um, I think they, you know, somebody needs to roll the screen because it's not, it's not letting me, there we go. Sorry, I'm having a little, little technical difficulties here. Enhance the organization's public standing is 
an obligation of the board overall, but that's also an individual obligation of board members. And we'll get to individual board member obligations later. This is an, an these are overarching categories. But it's it's the, the public standing of the organization that you're looking at. The public image, the public standing. Board, the board should be working to articulate the organization's mission and accomplishments and goals in a way that the public will understand them and that will garner support from the public. And so this is um, an overarching board responsibility, but it's also something that every individual board member has an obligation to do, which is to talk the organization up, to talk about the great programs of the organization, and to make sure that your circle knows about the organization on whose board you serve as a way of continuing to build the image of the organization in the public, not just in the media. Number nine is pretty straightforward, legal and ethical integrity. That's, um, that's a huge responsibility for the board, your fiduciary responsibility, making sure that the organization, I had, had one board where the organization hadn't filed a Form 990 for several years and they lost their tax exempt status. And I can I can see you rolling your eyes. I can't see you, but I can see you rolling your eyes out there. Like who? How could that possibly happen? But their board of directors wasn't paying attention. Didn't even notice that they weren't getting a copy of the 990 every year. So board members need to know what the legal obligations are, and watch. For those things. If it's time to file the 990 and you haven't gotten a copy of it yet, it's perfectly okay to inquire. Maybe you start with your board chair and say, have you gotten a copy of the 990 yet? You have a responsibility to make sure that the organization follows its, um, its legal obligations. So know what the obligations are so that you can ensure that they're followed. And finally, board development. Kat talked about this earlier. The board owns its own development. And this is frequently something I see board members thinking is not only not their job, but it's the job of the executive director. Like, well, we have two new board members. When is the, when is the executive director going to schedule their orientation? And when is she going to get them uh, oriented and provide them with <laughs> materials and whatever? And there are boards, and, and I'm, there's certainly EDs who love to uh, recommend board members and get their people that they trust and have confidence in on the board. But the reality is it's the board's job to fill those positions and to find the right people who will fit in with the needs of the organization. And it's the board's job to orient its own new members, and it's the board's job to evaluate its own performance. The board doesn't just evaluate the ED. The board also needs to be evaluating itself. And I know that one of the things that we sent out in the materials is just a sample of a board self-assessment. There are lots of them out there. You can just look around and find one that seems to fit your organization. But at least once a year, your board should be doing an evaluation of how well it's performing. And, that, and, and make adjustments as you need to. Make adjustments so that you can, um, so that you can do what you need to be doing. Um, a, few, a few examples, um, written job description. If you don't have a job description for individual board members, even if it's just a list of things from this, um, from this webinar, then when board members say, well, they didn't know what the expectations were, that's not going to be a surprise. Uh, have a schedule of meetings so that every board member knows in advance when the meetings are for the year so that you, you don't get, oh, well, I only had a month's notice and I already had something else scheduled so I can't make it. Um, make sure that information and agenda and materials all go out in advance. That's not the job of the executive director to do an agenda for your board meeting. That's the job of the board to do that. Now you may have assistance from the ED, you may have somebody on staff who helps with that and who sends things out, but the responsibility lies with the board. 
um, it's that self cleaning mechanism, that self yeah, like, um, self responsible organism, if you will. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Kat, you're up. Yeah, so uh, you know, one of the things uh, we did share the, uh, as Kim mentioned, a, an example, one um, type of board assessment, and I will tell you that that one is one that RSP developed that links directly back to those ten responsibilities that Kim just talked about, and walks you through what each of those responsibilities, where you stand as a board, and it gives you an opportunity for that big picture um, critical self-assessment. Um, when, when we're talking about the responsibilities of the board, and Kim was talking about ensuring legal and, in, and, and ethical integrity, a big part of that um, is, lies in really being thoughtful about and creating an atmosphere where conflict of interests, policies, and statements um, are a routine way of life. Um, I, I would say, every board will face tension or conflict at some point between interests of the organization and interests of an individual board member. And that if uh, we have been thoughtful about and attentive to um, the ways that we put safeguards in place, um, that we will have a much easier time of identifying and dealing with um, possible or uh, perceived conflicts of interest. Um, one of the things that I know is that in agencies, um, oftentimes a perceived conflict of interest can be just as damaging as an actual conflict of interest. And certainly when we're talking about conflict of interest, we, we mean sometimes very much money, um, meaning that a conflict of interest is usually defined as an interest that might affect or reasonably appear to affect uh, the judgment or conduct of any director, officer, or staff member in a manner that is adverse to the interests of the organization. Um, however, I think we can all think of multiple times where there have been conflicts that have not actually been tied directly to money. And by money, I'm thinking more specifically of things like contracts. So as we think about conflicts of interest, I think uh, it's oftentimes boards would like to have really concrete guidelines about, well, this is allowable and this isn't allowable. And unfortunately, it's not always that easy. Uh, however, we can put some safeguards in place that go a long way towards preventing and avoiding those conflicts of interest. Um, you should always have an established policy related to conflict of interest, which is understood and signed by all board members when they join the board. Um, for some uh, organizations, they choose a simple sort of declaration uh, of uh, the conflict um, policy, and for others, they want really more detailed information about potential conflicts that board members might bring um, due to their financial interests. We also, within a board um, conflict of interest sort of um, setting, want to make sure that we're establishing disclosure as a normal sort of process that board members find it customary um, for someone to announce, like, I, I feel like I might have a potential conflict and I'd like to discuss um, um, what the options are um, if I need to recuse myself, if I need to not be a part of this discussion, or up to and including if I need to step off the board if this remains an ongoing um, potential or perceived or real conflict. Um, so when we're talking about it, one of the examples that comes to mind for me with an agency that I worked for uh, was an agency that um, is based in an area that gets just a ridiculous amount of snow. I'm here in Iowa, and we often get a ridiculous amount of snow. Um, and there was a need for the agency to have someone to plow their uh, uh, driveway and their uh, um, parking lot. And one of the members of the board had a, a, a relative who owned a, a towing and um, and plowing company. When we think about a, a conflict of interest, often folks might immediately jump to, well, that would be a conflict. We cannot um, go with, in fact, that company that has some sort of um, tie to a board member who might then have a financial gain. In fact, if we have a conflict, conflict of interest policy, that is clear about the fact that um, we will do an open request for proposals, that we will look broadly at all of the different proposals that come in, and that we'll select the best uh, um, 
vendor um, to meet our need, and that the um, uh, board member has disclosed the relationship and the potential conflict, and that they have recused themselves, that would be a very different um, sort of situation. So when we're talking about conflicts of interest statements and con conflict of interest policies, I think normalizing disclosure, normalizing those conversations, and then creating a, a real attitude and atmosphere of personal integrity um, around how we do our work and how we um, support this agency by really understanding and preventing conflicts at that level. When we think about conflicts of interest, when we think about um, ethics, one of the other things that I am so aware of is that um, we are also talking uh, oftentimes within that about liability. And as we start to think about individual board member liability, there are some things that you can do very specifically to manage that liability. Um, as Kim was talking about earlier in terms of the duties um, of a board, that duty of due care, um, the piece around attending meetings, paying attention, um, making sure that you're actively participating in the conversations that are happening is a key component of managing um, your liability as a board member. Um, certainly knowing and following the policies and the laws and uh, governing documents that apply to the organization, avoiding those conflict, conflicts of interest, and then requesting counsel when necessary. When there's a bigger issue than perhaps you as a board can sort out on your own. I will say all of this is sort of buttressed by directors and operators insurance, um, which every organization should have and is able to protect some of the interests of both the board members and the staff of an organization, um, provided that they have taken these steps to manage their liability. Um, as I think most folks know, uh, in insurance companies love to not have to pay um, out for claims, and so inevitably in a situation where there might be some sort of need uh, to engage that directors and operators insurance, unless you can prove that you've been meeting that duty of due care, that you've been attending meetings and paying attention, that all of those um, pieces have been in place, they will oftentimes void their responsibility. So there are really specific ways. DNO is important, um, but the actual individual members of the board have specific things that they can do as well um, to help manage their liability and make sure they're covered um, by that directors and operators insurance. I want to take a, uh, just a second to see if folks have questions about any of the topics that we've covered so far. Um, and if you do, please remember you can, um, in private chat function, uh, um, start uh, a tab to communicate with Ellen Yen Wyckoff, who will share those questions with us, because we would love, certainly, to answer some of your questions. Um, and in the meantime, I would love to see if folks can tell me which of the following in this polling question is not one of the three duties of a board that we discussed today. And you'll see again your polling um, function to the left. Uh, and I do see the responses coming in. Fantastic. And we, uh, as I see people um, typing in their answers right now, we have about 80%, 82% of folks who have identified C, the duty of stewardship, is not one of the three duties, and that is absolutely correct. Um, as Kim shared, the duty of care, the duty of loyalty, and the duty of obedience are the three legal duties that guide boards um, in their work and that each uh, director has um, as a legal obligation. So thank you for participating in that polling question. And then we have one more for you. Must boards of directors have a conflict of interest policy? Is that true that they must have a, a conflict of interest policy or false? Oh, I am so appreciative of you all right now. We're hovering around 100%, down just a little bit, 95. 96, yes, it's true. Boards of directors uh, must have a conflict of interest policy. There are a number of things that as uh, organizations we must have in place um, to meet standards set out both by the IRS as well as oftentimes uh, state and other federal um, organizations. And a, a conflict of interest policy is absolutely one of those. So I'm excited to see um, that so many folks believe that to be a really essential and necessary part of 
of the work. And with that, I am going to turn it back over to you, Kim. Great. Thanks, Kat. We're on key roles and responsibilities of a nonprofit board member, and this is about the individual member's responsibilities. This is the kind of thing that you talk with new board members about and maybe give them a list of when you invite somebody to be on, the, on your board so that they know what they're getting into and what, what is expected of them. And they're similar in many ways to the overarching uh, responsibilities of the board, but these are things that every individual board member can participate in, including supporting the executive director, being there when called upon to help, participating actively in the setting of policy and not just leaving that to the executive director to, uh, to set everything out and you rubber stamp it. Uh, know what you're voting on. Know what these policies are that you're voting on and why the organization needs them. Monitor finances, everybody knows that one. Raising money, not so clear. I think we have all run into board members who say, raising money, that's not my job. I have to raise money for my own agency. I shouldn't have to raise money as a board member. Well, unless you have made that arrangement when you joined the board that they would not have that expectation of you, every board member should be making an individual contribution that is significant for that person. And for a per one person, $25 may be a really significant gift for them. And for another person, $1,000 they might not even feel. It wouldn't even be a significant gift for a person of great wealth. So the gift should be significant to that person. Um, this individual gift, in addition to reaching out and raising money from other people and participating in the fundraising plan. And of course, long-range planning is, uh, is an important part of it. But, but this isn't all. There are, are a lot of specifics that you should be talking with your new board members about. Coming to board meetings, right? Every board member should show up at board meetings, participate in committee meetings, show up at special events if they can. They need to understand the organization. Take the time to learn about the organization, to understand the mission and programs, to see firsthand if you can what kind of services the organization is providing so that you can then talk knowledgeably about the organization. Read the materials before the board meeting. Don't walk into the board meeting having not looked at all of those things that were sent to you to read in advance. Participate in a committee. You know, this is not just a free ride for your resume. You should, as a board member, be participating actively in at least one committee. You should be talking to people about the organization, posting on social media if you're on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. Repost every once in a while from the organization. Follow their feed and, and repost so that your community of, of friends and followers and colleagues see that you have an interest in this organization. You know, I don't think it's too much to expect board members to stay up to date on, on what's going on in the field, to understand the subject matter of your agency, to stay up on what's happening in domestic violence or sexual assault or, or child welfare, whatever kind of agency you're working for. And, um, and and one of my favorites is, and this is not a do, this is a don't do, board members should refrain from making special requests of the staff. If, the, if a board member needs something or wants something, that request should go to the ED to be uh, assigned or requested. The board member should not be going directly to the staff around the, the ED. To, um, to ask for things. And I think that probably every board, every board I've been affiliated with has had that happen. And it can, it can cause problems. And it's also not respectful to the executive director to, to do that. And the, the next item is on communication. And it's, you know, this, we probably should have made this one the first slide because it really is the most important, uh, I think it's the most important thing. If your executive director and your board are not communicating, don't have a good positive relationship, you're going to have more problems than you know what to do with. The, uh, you know, we, we've all known EDs who would say that they were happiest when their board was quiet. 
that's not a good sign. Or board members who are, well, I'm, I'm your boss. Do what I want you to do. I actually heard of one where the, the board chair, this was not one of my boards, where the board chair sent the ED flowers on National Secretary's Day and meant it seriously. Oh, I think it was Administrative Professionals Day was what it was called and, and saw that as a serious thing. So you've got to have a great, effective relationship between your board and your executive director, and you're not going to have that if you're not talking and if you're not communicating. And the probably the most important part of that is to make sure that you have the same expectations. And if you have expectations of your executive director, those expectations should have been made clear. You don't want to get to the evaluation and say, well, we're really disappointed that you didn't do X. And your ED says, what? I was supposed to do X? We never talked about X. It's communication, but it's the most important thing that you do. And we'll be talking about evaluation more in a minute. Kat? Absolutely. So one of the things that um, is another really important role um, for the board is being able to understand and separate management from policy. Um, I think in all of the pieces that Kim and I have been talking about today so far, those roles and responsibilities of a board, it is at a policy and governance level that we're talking about boards being so crucial. Um, the management, the day-to-day -day management uh, of the agency is actually under the purview of the executive director. And when we're talking about sort of being able to separate out that management from that policy, it it becomes really crucial that everybody is on the same page and that they understand that there are very different board and executive director or staff responsibilities. Um, one of the places that I have certainly seen this happen um, where all of that gets kind of moshed up together and it, it begins to cause um, real problems um, for the administration and running of the organization as well as the governance of the organization is when a board maybe has to step in at some point due to a transition or a crisis, and they may have to fill some roles that they haven't traditionally filled. And as they install a new executive director and begin supporting that executive director in their work, they don't also then take that step back and recognize um, really the importance of chain of command in terms of um, the organization. Um, because as we know, and this is a, a crude terminology for our, our sort of field, but staff members are the ones who respond to the people that we serve. Supervisors, if you have um, that sort of uh, level, that sort of middle management level, supervises the staff members. The executive director supervises either the supervisors or the staff members themselves in, in so many of our organizations. And the board actually manages one employee, and that is the executive director. And in that sort of supervision of the one employee, um, there are a number of pieces that they're responsible for. And certainly, as Kim was suggesting, one of them is the evaluation of the executive director. It is absolutely best practice to have a board policy on evaluation um, to make sure that there is a plan in place um, for evaluation that has uh, a, a timeline, a schedule of activities, and that includes um, really the expectation that the board is sharing uh, early on uh, what will be involved in that evaluation, how the evaluation will be done, and what the executive director will be evaluated on. Um, this is one of those places that I have seen great board and uh, executive director relationships fall apart, um, is when there hasn't been a really clear, first of all, understanding or expectation around what it is that you are expecting of the executive director in his or her role, um, but second of all, that there has not been any discussion about how that will be evaluated, what the timeline will look like, what the process will be, and it feels then sometimes like folks are in very different places where it gets sprung on somebody um, without a lot of ability to put thought into it. 
we know really from all of our, I think, roles um, supervising folks that an evaluation should never be the first place that someone is hearing um, specific feedback about their work. Um, I think that when we think and talk about um, boards supervising um, executive directors of organizations, that it is even more important to be intentional about that ongoing opportunity for feedback, both in terms of what we think folks are doing well and in terms of what we think there is room for improvement on. As a supervisor, as someone uh, who uh, supervises an employee of an agency, for example, you are probably in fairly regular contact with the folks that you supervise on a daily basis. You're sharing with them really immediate kinds of feedback about the work that they're doing. It should be the same between an executive director and a board of directors. That is, is absolutely one of the functions of the board, and um, it will help uh, so much to build the relationship, to build the communication. And when you get to that point where you are actually engaging in an evaluation, it will be on clearly shared expectations um, for the executive director's role. It won't be anything that has not already been discussed at some point in terms of immediate feedback about uh, the work that that executive director is doing. And it should be a real opportunity to talk about plans for the next uh, coming year, um, places where perhaps there were gaps and where you can work together to strengthen a knowledge base, uh, skills, or whatever it might be, and also to talk about professional development and how you'd like to move forward supporting the executive director in making sure that they have all of those skills necessary to run the organization. So I have a question for you all. Tell me uh, whether it's true or false that the Board of Directors hires, supervises, and evaluates the Executive Director. And you'll see that to the left and yeah, sometimes we have to just throw one in there that's, that's just sort of a given. And obviously, this one, you all have said, 100% of you have said <laughs> that that is true. That in fact, the Board of Directors hires, supervises, and evaluates the Executive Director, which I am, am very pleased to see. I think that when we're talking about the role of the Board in um, supervising an Executive Director and making sure that we are really establishing that we are working with one employee, that one of the things that we often need to do is to, to model that and to, to make sure that there are clear expectations about that for both staff and boards. Kim, I remember you saying earlier, uh, you know, a board member who went to a staff person with a request um, and said, hey, I need this, rather than going to the executive director. The sort of best practice um, model for communication and, uh, and, and work together is that the board communicates with the executive director, and the executive director, in fact, is then the liaison back to the staff. And that needs to be something that's very clear on both sides. Um, one of the places that we often see struggle is when it, uh, uh, staff members go directly to board and bypass the executive director, or vice versa, the other way, where a board member bypasses the executive director and goes directly to staff. The more we're able to have really clear expectations for each other about the flow of information and about appropriate direct channels, the more we're able to then hold each other accountable to those. The board supervises and communicates with one employee, and that employee is then the liaison back to all of the other staff. So, I, sorry, go ahead. This is Ellen. We have a question from a participant. Absolutely. And so the question that they had is um, if you had any suggestions for helping a board step back into their role, you know, specifically what you were discussing, and supporting their executive director as the executive, because sometimes that they've had experiences where the board feels burned by a bad executive director. Absolutely. And find it hard to turn it over or turn it back. Any suggestions? And it's, you know, that ties into so many different things. And, and Kim, when you were talking earlier about um, one of the, the struggles can be a board not really taking the time and intentionality to, to figure out what they need in a new executive director, for me it triggered something that relates very much to that, that question, Ellen, that we received from a participant. 
you know, oftentimes my sense is that if a board has had to really step up and into a role that they have, are not usually in, in terms of helping to make sure that the organization is um, stable and well managed during an executive transition, that oftentimes that puts requirements on a board. That's true of a routine transition, certainly a planned transition, but it's even more so when we're talking about a transition during crisis, right? And that boards are often uh, needed to step up to make difficult decisions, to really go to bat oftentimes in terms of pitching in in places where they have not traditionally or typically had a role, nor should they um, traditionally or typically have a role. However, once that sort of um, transition uh, is in place and is happening, there are two things that I see. One is that boards struggle to take a step back from um, that immediate crisis and transition to really identify long-term and forward thinking what they're looking for in, exec in an executive director. Rather, they often, um, in a very sort of um, reactive way, will say, well, this is what just happened and we want the opposite. So we're going to go immediately for the opposite. Or if it was a planful transition and the executive director had been doing a fabulous job, they say, we want somebody just like that old executive director, right? And instead of really taking a step back and saying, where is the organization and where will we be uh, in 12 months, in three years, where do we want to be? And what are the skills that we're looking for in an executive director who will help move us towards that? So I think that intentionality is so important in terms of finding the right fit. And then to recognize as a board, you're right, your role doesn't end immediately um, once you have sort of shepherded the organization through that transition or through that crisis. You've hired someone new. Often at that point, the board feels a little bit exhausted, has been my experience. Mm -hmm. And they are ready to just hand everything over to that new ED and say, get to it. <laughs> in some situations. In other situations, they've been so integrally involved in the sort of day-to-day -day operations um, of the organization out of necessity that they fail to be able to sort of identify the fact that now they've put someone in place to attend to that, and it's time for them to stay, take that big step back into the big picture governance role um, that's truly appropriate for boards. And I think that the way, the only way that that can be addressed is by having those really um, uh, clear conversations about what the role of the board is, what the role of the executive director is, and figuring out how to support your executive director that you've just hired in taking back on all of those roles um, that, that are really appropriate for them and beginning to give those up as, um, as the board. Now, does that mean you just hand them over and have zero oversight? Absolutely not. And being really clear about, again, what your expectations are and how you're going to be monitoring that can be a great part of that onboarding and, and that discussion. And I think especially in places, um, you know, Ellen, as, as we heard from that participant, in places where boards feel quote unquote burned um, by uh, uh, an executive director transition that happened because of crisis or because of mismanagement or whatever else it might have been, um, that their, their sort of commitment to figuring out how do we now um, really go back to um, the uh, appropriate uh, model of sort of administration and governance, which is us taking that big picture policy and governance perspective, the strategic thing, uh, planning and thinking, and letting the executive director that we have chosen carry out all of those other activities while, of course, monitoring and, and, and sort of checking in with them. Because the last thing you want to do is sort of throw them into a, that void, right? Yeah. So hopefully so that answered, answered that question that, that folks had brought up. And I think we should move on, yeah, then to our next slide. And Kim, I'm going to let you take over. Great. Thank you, Kat. As you might imagine, financial responsibility is one of the areas where a lot of things can go wrong. And uh, the financial responsibilities are actually pretty straightforward. They're not that complicated. But uh, there are a lot of boards that um, hand that over to the executive director and don't stay on top of the finances in the way that they ought to. And um, you know, probably some of the worst catastrophes in nonprofit organizations that I know of have been related to the finances. 
So setting the financial direction just means adopting a budget that reflects your mission and priorities. So when you set your mission for the organization, you set your priorities, make sure that the budget you adopt reflects that mission and that you're putting your money where your mission is. Then it's the job of the, the executive director or the chief executive to carry out that budget, to implement that budget in line with your mission. And then the board's job from then on is to keep an eye on the financial status. You're going to get regular reports. If you're not getting regular reports, at least quarterly, you should ask for them. And they should be reports that you can understand. If you have board members who don't have the knowledge to understand a balance sheet and what to look for in a balance sheet or don't understand an income and expense statement, sometimes called a profit and loss statement, get training for them. Have somebody on your board with financial experience walk the board members through what that means. Have somebody come in from the outside. Have the agency CEO, uh, CFO come in and, and walk them through what it means and what to look for. But that's part of the board's obligation uh, to, to govern itself, is to make sure that your members have the knowledge they need to carry out this fiduciary responsibility. We already talked about uh, approving the annual budget. Approving financial procedures and setting policies. Your, your policies are, are your overarching things like one policy might be that you have to maintain a separation of duties in your accounting department or um, ensure that there's an adequate ind independent approval of your expenses. And then the procedures are how you accomplish that. How do you, uh, you know, who does what in order to maintain um, internal controls and internal separation? Or how many signatures do you need on a check of what amount? Um, the policies might be, you know, whether the organization will have a line of credit and who can draw on it. But the procedures might be how that actually happens. So the procedures are generally done by the staff or the executive director and approved by the board, but the board itself should be uh, setting those financial policies and talking about what, what kind of policies should be in place, working, of course, with your executive director. And then finally, monitoring the financial status just is it, pretty simple. It's when you get a financial statement quarterly, monthly, whenever you get it, there should be a, a column there that says what your budget is so that you can look and see whether you are on track with where you're supposed to be. If you're six months into the year, you ought to be somewhere in the general vicinity of 50% of that expense and 50% of that revenue item. And if it's off, if it's not close to that, then there should be a note. It could be verbal, but written notes are helpful to say this is low because or this is high because. But you should have an understanding of why it's different if it's not, if it's not close to where you think it should be at this time of year. Um, ensuring that the organization is financially solvent, we, you know, we've talked about that a lot, but make sure that there's a fundraising plan in place. If there's not a fundraising plan in place, the board can do it, the ED can do it, you can do it together, you can have a committee, a fund development committee that does it, but you need a fundraising plan and then that's what the organization, what the board monitors the organization's accomplishment of that fundraising plan, which is not entirely the responsibility of the ED, but everybody shares that responsibility. And it's not on here, but back on those legal obligations, there are a lot of obligations related to your financial status, not just the 990, but that's part of your job too as a board member is to make sure that you have the, the proper governance practices and that you are following those. And that, if, for instance, if you look at the 990, there are a whole bunch of government, governance practices listed on the 990, and you should be able to answer yes to all of those as a board member. And if you look at the organization's 990 and it has yes checked next to do you have a whistleblower policy, and you say as a board member, what? We have a whistleblower policy? <laughs> 
chances are that that's a sign that you are not as familiar with the organization's policies and procedures as you should be as a board member. And one of the other items that we uh, included with the handouts is something called financial questions to ask. And they're just, they're pretty basic questions. Um, but I think the most, the most important two questions that the, a board member or for that matter the, uh, the ED should ask is, is our financial plan consistent with our strategic plan? In other words, does our budget match our mission? And are we spending more than we're bringing in? Because if you're spending more than you're bringing in on a consistent basis, you have to ask questions. It may be okay. You may be spending down a bequest. You may have restricted funds that came in in a prior year and you're spending them this year, but you should ask the question. You should understand what it means. And Absolutely. Uh, and one more thing, I just want to mention restricted versus unrestricted because I know now two boards that have gotten in trouble with, by looking at that nice fund balance and saying, oh yeah, we can spend money, look at that nice fund balance, only to find that it was almost entirely restricted. And what they were spending money on or wanting to spend money on was unrestricted purposes and they did not have unrestricted money. So that's something the boards really need to keep an eye on, and the EDs as well. Kat? Absolutely. So really, we're, you know, when we think about the Board of Directors, uh, the Board of Directors has two sort of distinct financial roles. Um, one of them, that governance role, where the board is, uh, is ensuring accountability, and that's largely what Kim has been talking about. Making sure that, um, you know, you are attending to all of the sort of uh, um, uh, financial policies and procedures and, um, and monitoring that needs to be done. But there's a second role that I think often gets left out but is in, just as crucial and that Kim has been um, talking about and I've been alluding to in all of our um, talk about boards, and that is that there's also a, a very distinct support role um, in terms of finances, one in which board members support the organization uh, in lots of different ways around for fund development. And, and Kim, I love it when you said, you know, it's, it's not just the ED's um, sort of job to do fundraising and fund development. And I would actually go even one big picture step further and say that ultimately it's the board's entire job. And that the, the executive director and staff absolutely have a role to play in how we do that, but that I'd like to flip that paradigm on its head and say, in fact, the board is ultimately responsible for the sustainability and the governance of this organization. And that as a part of that, you have to have a realistic strategy for raising funds. Um, you have to make sure that, your, uh, that the, the organization has the money that it needs to be able to continue doing the important work um, that you obviously as, you know, as an executive director believe in, that board members believe in, that, that we have as a shared sort of vision and mission. So in recognizing that, um, boards really have to come up with some sort of fund development plan, a strategy for fundraising that has at least these three characteristics, that it results in the funding that's necessary um, for the organization in order to continue doing its work, that provides funding for an emergency reserve, uh, for evening out that cash flow that's so important to all of us in terms of being able to juggle often multiple um, uh, state, local, and federal grants. Um, and then that is also in line with the organization's ethics and values. And this is one of those places where I think the board role um, has uh, um, a, a, a juncture um, between the sort of fiscal or fundraising responsibility and that conflict of interest and ethics piece that we talked about and that integrity piece that we talked about. 
So oftentimes it really comes up to a board level conversation and decision um, about whether within that strategy you would be willing, for example, to accept donations or money from a gun manufacturer, uh, from a liquor company, from an adult entertainment establishment, or whether you actually even want to seek those agencies out or those organizations or businesses out um, to attempt to uh, support services using some strategy around that. Um, those are the kinds of conversations that boards should absolutely be having. So that strategy typically is going to include uh, a lot of different approaches. Um, we know that organizations, that boards um, and, uh, and organizations oftentimes might come up with a fee-for-service plan in terms of training fees or registration fees. Recognizing, of course, that most of us are bound also um, to be really thoughtful about and or not charge um, fees for some of our services um, for lots of different reasons, but thinking about fee-for-service where that's possible. Um, using special events, uh, social media and mail campaigns, um, certainly continually seeking out new government contracts as well as those individual major donor gifts and grants from private and, and corporate foundations. And as, as sort of a board, your role oftentimes is also in helping to sort of make that strategy um, uh, a reality. So first you want to lay out what is our strategy, and then secondly, you really want to move into a place of now how do we take that strategy and really turn it into a reality. When we think um, about the sort of crucial roles of fundraising on a board, and I like um, uh, the one of the the pieces that I think about a lot is that the board is absolutely responsible for approving and monitoring the performance of some sort of revenue strategy. When we talk about revenue strategy, it's a different term for the same thing. Fund development plan, fundraising strategy, whatever that might be that sustains the organization's work. In the context of that plan, each board member has a responsibility to do something to help implement that strategy, including a personal gift, as Kim was talking about. We also recognize that it's impossible for any one person to do everything, and that we often have laid that expectation at the feet of the executive director of an organization, and we want to place that really firmly back as a, as a shared expectation with a preponderance of responsibility on a board. And then we want to make sure that as a part of that sort of fundraising strategy, that we are really communicating with new board members about what our expectations are, um, that we're creating a culture of fundraising, a culture of giving, um, and really helping to make sure that the organization has the resources it needs to sustain its services. And Kim, I think you were going to cover the four W's. Yeah, we were we were joking about this <laughs> because I learned these as the four W's of board membership. <laughs> that uh, when I was learning about this, it was these were the four things that you were looking for in your board members: work, wisdom, wealth, and wallop. But it works just as well for fundraising, meaning that you are looking for from your individual board members. You want them to work towards fundraising. You want them to give their time, whether it's working that event or calling their friends for money. You want their wisdom. You want their knowledge, their influence with their, uh, with their contacts as well as their, um, their understanding of the issues. Wealth, you want a personal contribution. It may not be great wealth, but whatever it is that, uh, that would be a significant gift. That's something that's reasonable to expect from every board member. And then wallop is a, a whole other level, exercising influence on legislators and other policymakers. That's a great quality to have on your board, but it's also really effective in fundraising, especially when you are uh, expecting a significant part of your um, budget to come from government funding, whether it's local, state, or national funding, or from uh, corporations. If you've got people on your board who have wallop, they can help you with that. Very, all four of those are pretty important qualities. Absolutely. So as we have sort of explored um, uh, how to 
uh, be really clear about board roles, expectations, um, uh, and help to create uh, a real sort of shared idea about what um, board role should be. One of the things that we've mentioned several times is long-range planning. Um, and when we talk about long-range planning, that as a responsibility of the board um, can certainly mean lots of different things for lots of different organizations. Um, you know, I remember when I started doing this work, and Kim, I'm guessing you too, that when we saw, talked about long-range planning, originally we talked about like seven to ten years. Um, oh, yeah. We were looking so far out in the future. As um, our uh, ex uh, sort of culture has changed as things so rapidly shift in terms of our political landscape, our economic landscape, our technology landscapes. A seven to ten year old, ten year plan often is not recommended anymore. Uh, we often now, when we talk about long range planning are talking about three to maybe five years, but typically keeping it at three. And some organizations actually choose to do long-range planning uh, um, of three years with those um, sort of one-year uh, concrete plans within it. So the board and the executive director should be having uh, conversations really uh, all year long about how best to guide the work of the agency. And it's the board who should put in place some sort of uh, plan to be able to do long-range planning. It's so funny. It's like you have to have a plan to plan. Um, but you really do. And when we talk about the strategic process, that plan to plan um, becomes really crucial. Strategic planning requires uh, that really all board members and staff members bring their best understanding of the agency and all of the things affecting it to the table and then begin to really share this incredibly uh, sort of specific vision for where the organization needs and wants to be and then lay out a roadmap of how they're going to get there. Um, in terms of strategic planning, we do often see as a best practice a committee that has staff and board representation on it to develop um, that strategic plan. We want to make sure that when we're doing strategic planning, we're um, being realistic about how we're going to use that strategic plan. I can't tell you how many organizations I've worked with who tell me, oh, we did a strategic plan three years ago, and it was a, a binder, and I have no idea where it is. And we haven't really looked at it since then. And when we're talking about a strategic plan, we really want it to be something, um, you know, ideally that guides the day-to-day -day sort of decisions that are made, um, both by the board and by the organization's executive director and staff. So the more we can focus on creating a, a document or a plan that can be referred to and, and really um, used as a guide, I think the more effective uh, our, our strategic planning process is. Um, you know, we have lots of different resources um, that are available in terms of thinking about strategic planning for your organization, in terms of thinking about evaluating your executive director, um, in terms of thinking about assessing um, your, your board sort of uh, um, efficacy and, and, um, and work. And we want to make sure that, you know, we sent out a number of resources before the webinar, but we'll certainly also be touching on whichever of these topics feel like they resonate um, for you all as we move forward with developing next step coaching calls. So as we're wrapping up sort of our time together today, one of the things that I just want to remind you all is that we have the opportunity to continue conversations and go much deeper, if you will, um, in terms of thinking about um, effective boards and board development. And so we'd love to hear from you a about if there's a topic you'd like to take a deeper dive into, if there's something that Kim and I didn't get to cover today, or something that we brought up that you would really like some more concrete ideas about, or to hear from others, peers, and others about how they're approaching, approaching it. So please let us know uh, if you have any of those, and we would love to support the ongoing work um, of your organizations through making sure that your board is able to lead through understanding their role and their responsibility, um, and to share whatever resources we can to make sure that that happens. So Ellen, I, I think that um, Unless we have any questions um, specifically from folks? 
at the time, it doesn't look like we have any questions. All right. Um, so um, certainly, if any of you have any questions, you can feel free to. Um, we'll be wrapping up this webinar shortly. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me or email me. Um, when you close out the, today's webinar, you will be getting a directly, um, you'll get the web page for our online evaluation. And you can also submit questions there. So Excellent. Great questions, we thank really want everybody. to thank um, Pat and Kim, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, hold on one quick second. I think we may have one final question. Um, so Kat or Kim, if you'd like to answer this before we wrap up, what do you do when a board member is not living up to their duties or responsibilities? <laughs> oh, that's such a good question, and I'm so sad that we're losing folks because it's 3.30 already. Um, but let's just quickly um, check in about that. And, and Kim, I would love to hear your sort of thoughts about it. My initial thought is, because the board is ultimately responsible for its own development and um, effectiveness, it's really the executive committee of the board that should deal with issues where there's a board member that is not living up to their duties. First of all, having the clear expectations, the job description that Kim was talking about, making sure that you have communicated the expectations around it um, uh, to the board member. And if they are, have been uh, still not able to live up to that, then it's time for a real conversation to happen usually, in my opinion, between the executive committee and the board member to say, look, we understand that you know, life gets in the way, things are busy, but you've made a commitment to this organization. And and it's your responsibility to, to really carry that out in these ways. And so I want to check in with you and see if that's something that you feel like you're able to do. And if not, is, you know, perhaps there's a different way that you could be involved. And Kim, I'd be curious to hear if you have a different perspective on how to approach that. No, I, I agree very much with you that this is the responsibility of, I would have said the board chair, but the entire mm -hmm. executive committee probably should be involved in something like this. And if the, if the member knows what the expectations are and isn't fulfilling them, then it's time for a conversation. And it just may be that that person would be totally relieved not to be on the board. Absolutely. They, they're overcommitted and they just don't know how to approach it. And so the conversation saying, we're not going to hate you. It's okay. Maybe there's another way that you can mm -hmm. contribute could be a tremendous relief to that person. On the other hand, they may be having some kind of crisis that you don't know right. about. And you would want to know that as well. Absolutely. I think that conversation, that initial conversation is about, we know you're, that you have a, you know, a, a commitment to this work. Are there ways we can support you in meeting these expectations? Um, and if that isn't going to work for whatever reason, you know, are there other ways you can support the agency? Because it seems like this isn't the best time um, for you to be taking on this role of a, of a board member. And I will say that as much as sometimes I think the individual board member is grateful for the conversation, that oftentimes the whole board can also be grateful because uh, if a board has a member that's not pulling their weight, um, that really isn't meeting those responsibilities, it can set a tone um, for the entire board and, and make folks feel like there's a, an unfair distribution of labor or that there's, the expectation isn't being applied across the board. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to be clear that it's not only important for that individual um, that we're having the, the conversation with, but that it's actually vitally important for the whole board itself um, to have that conversation and to not just uh, keep sort of moving on um, with one person who really isn't um, uh, sort of doing the work they need to be doing as a board member. Okay. Well, I think that we've gotten all the questions for today's webinar. And I'd like to just thank everybody for taking the time and also to thank Kat and Kim 